Maintaining the beauty of America, it's a team effort to keep our fields green and the waves of grain amber. Is there a company with the scale and the drive to make it in America? Briggs & Stratton thinks there is. All right, here's a puzzler. What the heck is going on with Briggs & Stratton, BGG? the maker of gasoline engines for outdoor power equipment and a number of lawn, garden, and job site products like generators, mowers, and sod cutters. Here's a company that reported a seemingly okay, maybe not fabulous quarter last Thursday, and yet the stock has been on fire ever since. Briggs & Stratton popped nearly 10% last Friday, then tacked on another 3% yesterday before rallying more today. The darn thing seems unstoppable. But when you look at the headline numbers from the quarter the company just reported, it doesn't look all that impressive, at least not at first glance. Briggs & Stratton delivered a one-cent earnings beat off of an 82-cent basis, significantly weaker than expected revenue, though, down 1.1% year-over-year. As for the full-year guidance for 2017, management just reaffirmed their early forecast. So why has the stock been soaring, hitting a new three-year high today? Was it simply a relief rally because Briggs & Stratton had issued cautious guidance in the past and the company's not doing better than some feared? Or is there something else going on here that's got investors super excited? For example, the gross margin, what it makes after the cost of goods sold increased by 150 basis points. The company's recently rolled out a bunch of popular new products. And if we have a decent gardening season, of course, and we're right on the cusp of it, then Briggs & Stratton should make a killing. Let's check in with Todd Teske, the chairman, president, and CEO of Briggs & Stratton, to get a better sense of how this company's doing where it's headed. Mr. Teske, welcome back to Man Money. Great to be with you, Jim. All right, Todd, I'm trying to figure out, because it's been a remarkable move, is it because of, your, of what I regard as a terrific push into higher margin commercial engines, or is it because you basically said we've begun to see signs that retail sales of lawn and garden equipment are beginning to increase, or is it a mix of both? Well, it's probably a mix of both, Jim, but really what you're seeing is the execution of our strategy over the last few years. We've been able to reposition our portfolio where we, we've got a great franchise in our residential business, and we've done extremely well in that over the years. But then we also have the opportunity now in some of the commercial markets, which perhaps you go back six, seven years, we didn't have the same opportunities. So it's things like commercial engines and commercial lawn mowers and job site and things like that. So you're seeing that margin lift, which really comes back to a lot of the innovation that we've had over the years, both in the residential side, and now you're starting to see it come through in the commercial end, too. But also, Todd, couldn't we say that this is part of what I regard as a larger trade? Our homes are growing in value. We want to be able to take care of them better. We want to power wash them. We want to do more imaginative things, bring out, invest in our homes, not just expense them. And Briggs and Stratton, not unlike Stanley Black & Decker, not unlike Masco, not unlike many of the companies like Sherwin-Williams, is part of what we regard as a new form of investment. Well, it's part of that, Jim, because if you think about the housing market over the last few years, and we are exposed to housing, especially on the residential side, but you've had this bifurcation that's gone on with uh, larger luxury type homes and, mm -hmm. and multifamily where you'll have commercial cutters, so you'll have commercial equipment used to cut the grass and take care of that type of facility, and we're in that type of equipment, while at the same time you've got the residential side where the starter step-up homes haven't been nearly as uh, robust as the high end. And now I think what we're starting to see is the fact that you've got starter and step-up homes, which there's a lot of demand out there, but not enough supply. And so as we look at our residential business, obviously the innovation plays into the margin expansion. But then as we look forward, we also see the opportunities as that part of the market continues to grow or will we'll, we'll kind of take hold, if you will. One of the things I really like was you talk about, you go into commercial and there's so much a white space. You only have a 10% share. You're talking about a $4 billion addressable market. Is that what all this innovation could, uh, could allow you to take more share from? Well, that's how we look at it. And so if you think about the commercial markets, they generally have been growing at about two times GDP. Right. And we expect that to continue. At the same time, we have the opportunity to take share as well. And that's where a lot of the innovation comes into play. And really, Jim, what we've, we think about it is customer insight, user-driven problem solving. And for the commercial users, it really comes back to productivity, efficiency, uptime. And so when you look at some of the innovations that we've come out with over the last maybe year or two, it has to do with things like longer maintenance intervals where we have a, a, a mower that can go 500 hours between maintenance intervals versus the normal 100 hours. 
that means better, better uptime, better productivity for the commercial cutter. And so you'll see us continue to try to penetrate more of that market. All right, now, Todd, th this morning we got this uh, news that there's going to be a tariff put on softwood coming from Canada. We know that the federal government is very, very uh, adamant that there is dumping of steel. A lot of the raw materials, you can't afford necessarily to have all these prices go up just because the White House wants to protect jobs. At what point will rising steel prices, because of tariffs, hurt your business? Well, it's really hard to say at this point, Jim, because all these tariffs and all this discussion is very much in the early stages. And so, obviously, we keep a very close eye on raw material costs. But at the same time, it really comes back to really giving the market what it wants. And so, to the extent that, you know, we have, we have some, some headwinds as it relates to commodities or other things, you know, we continue to look for ways to create tailwinds through the innovation and and, uh, and other things that we can do to, to grab market share in the commercial markets. Are there enough uh, highly skilled workers in this country to meet the demands that you have to be able to put, because you've got great plants all over the country, but are, are we producing enough workers for you? Well, Jim, you know, 85% of what we make is here in the U.S. And the reason we've been able to remain very competitive in the U.S. is through things like automation. We have more robots in one cell than when I started with the company 21 years ago. And so it really does start to create this skills gap. And I and other manufacturing CEOs have been out there talking a lot about the fact that we need uh, people who can run robots, program robots, CNC equipment, robotic welding, and things like that. It's a big issue, um, one that we've been able to figure out how to bring people in and train them up. And so we have our own development programs. But at the same time, I think, you know, there's more that we need to do as a country because the skills gap is only going to get worse, especially as more jobs come back here to the U.S. and if, in fact, some of the administration policies start to take hold. Right. Last question. We're incredibly conscious, and he seems to rain every day. I'm incredibly conscious as a gardener that I've got to be concerned about the weather. You, how, much, how much have you been able to take the weather out of the equation? How much do I have to look at the weatherman to worry about your near-term sales? Well, if you look at it, a big part of our diversification play and our strategy execution over the last few years is to get into markets that aren't weather related. So if you think about the Almond acquisition that we did a few years ago, it really gets us into job site, gets us into rental uh, and that sort of thing. And so ultimately, yes, we're going to be exposed to weather, especially on the residential side of the business. But it's really the whole diversification play and the execution of our strategy that's allowed us to be more predictable, less reliant on the weather overall. And I think that's exactly what's come to play about why this stock has had such a good run, because it makes a lot of sense. Todd Testi is the chairman, president, and CEO of Briggs & Stratton. Thank you so much, sir. Good to see you. Thanks, Jim. Look, this is the tipping point quarter, where they're obviously less involved and worried about the weather. You should be less involved and worried about it, too, if you own the stock. They have money's back after the break. Booyah! Jim Cramer here from Mad Money. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. Click here to subscribe and get the jump on my exclusives with CEOs, plus market news, investing advice, and a whole lot more.